Well, now I'd like to introduce um, our speaker tonight, David Cobb. He is the uh, national spokesperson for Move to Amend. Uh, he's also uh, one of the one of the one of the leaders of, of, of something called Democracy Unlimited of Humboldt County. But uh, of course, I remember, and we all remember, David Cobb as a presidential candidate for the Green Party. Right. You know, he uh, graduated from University of Houston Law School in 1993 after having, you know, worked his way through college at the University of Houston uh, doing construction work and things like that. Graduated with a bachelor's degree in uh, political science. Then he did, um, you know, opened up a law firm. Uh, he ended up being the uh, sort of general counsel for Green Party USA and helped um, uh, Ralph Nader in that 2000 election. So he comes from Texas. He doesn't. He doesn't. He, he can't make up for it. It's you know not not, not all of them put together. Him and Molly Ivins and Jim Hightower and Bill Moyers can't can't make up for it, but they, they can do the best they can. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so then, uh, but, uh, you know, back in, in, in 2004, there was a lot of confusion. We didn't know, you know, was Ralph Bader going to run? Was he not going to run? And we're all grateful to David Cobb for picking up the mantle and, and, and running as a Green Party president. I mean, that's, somebody's got to do it. It's not easy to do. And, um, you know, there was a discussion about, you know, why do, why do we need, why do we need Ralph? You know, we can we have, you know, one of us, we, we, we can do this. We don't have to wait around for Ralph Nader. Um, then back in 2004, remember there was these uh, debates in, in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let him in, you know, and he got arrested. I remember it was Jim Blair, I think, who was moderating that. I remember, you know, it was fantastic that he and the Libertarian candidate got arrested. Then came the election, and then came you know, and then came John Kerry. Remember, John Kerry said, I'm going to fight, right? They're not going to steal the election this time. And I, I mean, I don't even think 24 hours went by before. Right? But, you know, and it came in, right? You know, and, and, then, and then David Cobb did what we all are grateful to him for. He asked for a recount in the state of Ohio. Wow. He for that, we owe him a great uh, debt of gratitude. There's a lot of interesting things that happened through that recount. Maybe he would, would talk about that. But, uh, you know, we all as Americans owe uh, David Kahn great uh, debt of gratitude for the things that he's done to try to preserve democracy. And uh, now he's going to come up and talk about corporate personhood. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. You know, since we're in a place of worship, uh, I think that we need to tell the truth. And so since you brought up the uh, Ohio recount of 2004, I think that something that we need to say, and that is George W. Bush steals elections. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm not over it. And I'm not going to get over it. And I don't think that you should get over it either. Right? You should not let that pass. And from that, you might be able to tell, um, I like to start all of my presentations with this statement of facts. I am a proud, I am a patriotic, and these days I am a pissed off American citizen. Yeah. Oh good, the linear piece of the is the right kind of crowd for me because I will self-identify as a progressive like those of the, you in this room, yeah. and I'll tell you this, I think that we as progressives make a profound mistake if we allow the Tea Party to claim some sort of monopoly on righteous political anger in this country. Right? That is a mistake. Because I'll tell you something, folks. If you actually engage in a conversation with a Tea Party person and you, and you, you find a coherent one <laughs> that you can actually have that conversation with and you actually find one who's not just ate up with uh, racism and xenophobia, and, and you actually find some of those and you find out, well, what is it that you're really so angry about? In my, I do that. In my experience, when I talk to principal conservatives or Tea Party folks, what they're angry about is the fact that the big banks 
Wall Street America, the big corporations basically destroyed the economy of this country, and then the federal government rewarded them with a trillion dollars of our tax money. Well, you know what? I'm angry about that too. I think, and here's the thing. I think that the larger body politic needs to understand that progressives are also angry about that. We should not let people in sort of mainstream America think that the only people who are angry about the economic situation in this country and about the big banks and Wall Street are Tea Party folks, because we're angry too. And let me tell you something, folks. The anger that we feel is a righteous anger. And I use that word very carefully, knowing full well that we're in a church. It is a righteous anger. And righteous anger is what propels us. You know, in fact, it's not only okay to be angry, but we should be angry. I mean, we should be angry, right? We should be angry not only about the abstract, because it's not an abstraction, this economic crisis. What's happening today? One in six families are living in poverty in the most wealthy country the world has ever seen in any time in history. And one in five children go to bed hungry in this country. Of course we should be angry about that. Right? And let me go one step further. This country is racist, it's sexist, and it's class oppressive. Right? We have every reason to be angry. I think it's important to recognize that if we get angry and merely stay mired in anger, that is a very dangerous place to be, physically, emotionally, psychologically, and even spiritually. To get angry and only stay angry is very dangerous. And that's why as progressives, we know the secret. You get angry in order to allow, to propel you into righteous action. And it's action. It's action that's the sweet spot because if you look back at American history, it was righteous anger at the depraved institution of slavery that allowed people to be able to take up and struggle against it. It was righteous anger that propelled those women of Seneca Falls to be willing to challenge the entire cultural reality that they were experiencing. It was righteous anger that built the trade union movement in this country, right? And solidarity, absolutely. I make this pledge. I will not cross that picket line if it goes down. I will not cross that picket line. And when I get back to my home community, we have a Ralph's there, and I'm going to go and let the general manager know that if he, if not wholly irresponsible, just to let you know that if there is a strike, not only will I not cross it, but no, neither will any of my family and friends, and I'm going to let everybody know that. Right. right? That's what solidarity means, by the way. It's not a word. It's not merely a word. It's action. And so it's righteous anger that propelled the trade union movement. It's righteous anger that propelled the civil rights movement. Righteous anger is a good thing if it provokes action. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, I also think that it's important that we understand just how deep the crisis is that we are suffering. And in fact, I won't even call it a crisis because it's really a crisis, a crisis of crises, right? There are multiple crises. And the one thing that I will quibble with you just a bit in the choice of words, Scott, is there's not a budget crisis in this country. There's an allocation crisis, right? There's plenty of damn money. There is plenty of money. And you take a look at the big banksters in Wall Street and you look at the rich and you see that they're making ever more money than... It, it's never, the economic disparity in this country has never looked like this for a hundred years. The last time it looked like this, we called it the age of the robber barons, yeah. right? Yeah. We've got a problem in this country. Right. And I think, for me, underlying it all is this recognition, this bit of truth that I think that we need to tell. And it's not easy to tell in some circles, but I hope you, you will indulge me. And let me see if I get this right. The United States of America is not now, it has never been, and in fact it wasn't initially designed to be a functioning democracy. Right? And that's the problem. That's the problem. And you know, the thing is that it's so hard to gather in groups like we are and actually hear anybody stand up and actually say that, even though we know it's true. I mean, when is the last time that we heard a public elected official or anyone in a large crowd actually be willing to say the United States of America is not a democracy, but it could be. When is the last time that we heard an elected official actually just say, 
plainly and clearly the reality that the United States of America is racist, it's sexist, and it's class oppressive. Oh, and by the way, the existing economic institutions are literally destroying the planet that we all depend on for life itself. Right? We don't hear that, but we know it's true. I mean, that's crazy. Right? I mean, if I'm right, and I know I am, if I'm right that that's the level of the problem that we're facing, then at the very least, folks, we've got to be willing to tell the truth. And for me, once I have given myself full permission to tell the truth, it is incredibly liberating. I mean, it really is, because it prevents me from having to, to try to soft-pedal the truth. I mean, I can just tell the truth, and what I found by doing that, not only do I feel more liberated, it seems to give other people the permission to tell the truth, too. And when we do that, then we can really analyze what the problem is, and not so that we can just lament and say, oh, it's so, pro so difficult, but instead, when we really understand those, what we're up against and what the problem and problems really are, it suggests to us the solutions. Right? It suggests to us solutions. So, what I'm going to do tonight is sort of basically tell a story for how it came to be that these large transnational corporations have basically become the most dominant institutions on the planet and why that has happened and what we can do about it. So